Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. And I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Joy J. Moore. We skip ahead now quite a ways in the story of Israel uh, to the story of the Passover. Um, so Genesis ends with, uh, if you think about the three things that God has promised, descendants, um, a blessing, and uh, the land, uh, the, the problem of, the, of many descendants uh, has um, been solved, especially at the start of Exodus. In Exodus 1, it says they've been fruitful and multiplied and filled at the land of Egypt. But the promise of the land um, and, frankly, the promise of being a great nation has not been kept because now they are enslaved in Egypt. So this story, uh, you might want to preach rapidly through just the story of the call of Abraham and, the, and all the plagues. And this story then is the promise of the last plague, uh, the promise of the death of the firstborn, but more importantly, it's the promise of the Passover meal, and uh, it's the promise of the redemption of the people. We've included it in narrative lectionary because it's really important that Christians understand something about the Exodus story and especially about the Passover festival. Um, and so, uh, Catherine, I throw this to you because I know you have a funny story about uh, Passover festival. Oh, yes. Well, uh, so when I was in graduate school, uh, getting my uh, doctorate in Old Testament, uh, my advisor uh, was a wonderful Hebrew Bible scholar uh, named John Levinson. He still teaches at Harvard. Uh, and he uh, is Jewish, Orthodox Jewish. So I was in a class with him in the spring one year uh, on the binding of Isaac, the what Christians call the sacrifice of Isaac. And he uh, asked me to stay afterwards. And so I thought I was in trouble. And then he, and then he, uh, uh, he said, you know, Passover is coming or Pesach um, in Hebrew. Uh, and I'd like you to, uh, I'd like to invite you to the Passover meal at my home. And then a, a, a beat of silence, he said, we need a Gentile for the blood sacrifice. <laughs> so he, he uh, if I had not known him well, I might have been taken aback. But as it was, I just laughed and gladly accepted the invitation. And it was a wonderful, uh, a wonderful celebration and uh, time to experience a real Jewish Passover. Uh, but yes, uh, so he needed a, uh, they needed a Gentile for the blood sacrifice. <laughs> So we ended up going and and it uh, it was it's it's if you can imagine a worship service wrapped up with a meal and lots of wine and lots of singing uh, and some games that's the Passover meal. Uh, if you ever get invited, I'm speaking to our listeners and viewers here. Uh, if you ever get invited uh, to a seder, that's the the name of the Passover meal. Uh, do accept it. This. This particular time, it happened to be on the night before Easter, and I left at 2 a.m. because I needed to get to the Easter service the next morning, uh, and it was still going on. So, uh, But it, it's a wonderful experience. And what it does is it commemorates, of course, um, this event in the life of Israel, this, uh, this fulfilling of God's promise to uh, to bring the people out of slavery uh, and to bring them into their own land. Again, that promise that harkens back all the way to the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12. Uh, and, uh, and, and here, uh, uh, and when you celebrate the Passover, it's much like communion. And of course, uh, Holy Communion has its roots in this meal, of course, because in three of the four Gospels, the Passover meal uh, is the Last Supper. And, uh, and, and even in John, it's it's cl it's at the time of Passover. Uh, anyway, uh, so it's not a uh, it's not a thing that our ancestors did. It's something. It is something our ancestors did, but it's also uh, reenacted and and uh, 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 and and revivified. I don't know the word I want to use. Uh, Reactualized. It's actualized in. Uh, the lives of everyone who observes this Passover meal every year, right? Next year in Jerusalem, uh, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. Uh, um, you know, not not just our ancestors, but brought us out of Egypt. 
uh, you shall tell your child on that day. I'm looking at 13, Exodus 13, 8. Uh, you shall tell your child on that, that day. It is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. So that's true of that first generation in Exodus, but it's true of every subsequent generation after that as well. Speaking of uh, doctoral advisors, my teacher, Patrick Miller, said that the Exodus story is the Easter moment of the Old Testament. Just as Easter really tells us who God is, God is the one who raised Jesus from the dead. In the Old Testament, for the rest of the Old Testament, God is the one who brought Israel out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And you get that language in verse 3. Remember this day on which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Uh, and then it, then it goes through this at the end, and you already cited this verse. Um, you shall tell your child on that day. Catherine, isn't there, uh, or Joy, I don't know, isn't there a, um, a question the youngest child asks? And do people mm -hmm. still uh, do this? Uh, do faithful Jews still uh, like eat it with their staff in hand, ready to go, sort of? so to speak well it it, de it depends on the on the jewish household but uh there there is to answer your question yes in the seder liturgy there is a series of questions that the youngest asks things like uh why do we recline on pillows on this day and not you know not at other meals uh why do we you know uh what is what is this festival what is this meal about basically are all the questions you know why do we eat uh salt water and bitter herbs on this day? Why do we eat unleavened bread on this day and not, you know, not uh, uh, unlike what we do, you know, every week on, on uh, to celebrate Shabbat, to celebrate Sabbath? So yes, that it's very much an educational or kind of didactic dinner in the sense that uh, those who participate, uh, and especially the children, are taught what all the symbolism means, why why the practices uh, are done in the way that they're done, and and um, but but as to you know whether uh, Jews actually recline uh, at Professor Levinson's house, my memory of it is we sat in chairs, but we each had a pillow in the chair, right? So uh, so it depends. It depends on the household as to how uh, how they celebrate the seder. What's really neat in the language, um, because it is scripted, and in, in this script, um, the uh, reciting, and you, you, you uh, mentioned this, Catherine, the, the reciting is done uh, in first person. Uh, this is what God has done, is doing for us. Um, and so the um, ancient story is accepted and adopted as the present narrative of the people. Right. And so what God has done is believed to be what God is doing. It's the imagination that this storied world is living, is a living word, and it becomes our story. Uh, and sometimes in the African-American community, we talk about that, that we have um, in, uh, adopted this story as our narrative. And to claim to be the people of God is just that. It is to claim that this creator God's intention for the world, despite our continued walking out on the story, is a demonstration of God's faithful to narrate us back in. And when we accept that, as our world and worldview, the word becomes living because it is, it is a promise. When we recognize how God has shown up in the past, we can see where God is in the present. And that's hope for a future that we don't yet see. That's, that's really beautiful and beautifully said, Joy. I, I just want to, I want to add one more thing, and that's to acknowledge that the Passover is a difficult story, right? I mean, the killing of the or the the death of the firstborn uh, is is difficult, and in the seder, in the Passover meal, that difficulty is acknowledged. So yes, uh, there's a practice of taking, uh, you know, there's several several cups of wine through the meal, uh, and at one point you take uh, your spoon and you dip it into the cup of wine and you put a drop of wine, you put 
10 drops of wine on your plate, the wine symbolizes joy and the, the depletion of the wine, the taking, uh, you know, from the wine is to acknowledge the sorrow uh, and the pain and the suffering that was inflicted on the people of Egypt uh, in the 10 plagues. So you dip 10 times into your wine and put that on the plate. So I, I think it's just good to acknowledge that. I, I want to say one other thing, though, and that's um, something my uh, beloved teacher, Ellen Davis, taught me all the way all the way back in my MDiv days uh, in seminary when she talked about the po- Passover. She said, the Passover is an antidote to cruelty, right? It's an antidote to cruelty because ever after this, it says in the text, you know, throughout – uh, uh, particularly Deuteronomy and Leviticus and Numbers, remember that you, and Exodus. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, right, don't treat your slaves the way in which or you, people under your authority in the way that you were treated. So it's an antidote to cruelty. Remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt. And Passover is also an antidote to nostalgia. Uh, mm. uh, uh, remember the cruelty that you experienced. Remember, uh, uh, remember the uh, you know the the plagues and the and the uh, that God took you out from suffering with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, S- and so that you don't go back to that, right? Because of course we know that after the crossing of the Red Sea, uh, the Israelites want to go back to the flesh pots of Egypt, right, and eat their fill and have the. Uh, the the leeks and the fish and whatever you know. Well, let's All go back to Egypt. They say over and over food. again. That's right. All that good Mediterranean. <laughs> so so the pass yeah. So the Passover as an antidote to cruelty. The Passover as an antidote to nostalgia, uh, and the Passover as a remembrance of God fulfilling God's promises to the people, not just in the face of uh, uh, of infertility or of. Uh, you know, um, uh, local opposition, but really in the face of a, a, a death-dealing ruler like Pharaoh, who becomes in his own way a kind of angel of death. Right? Uh, God's promise, God's faithfulness to God's promises in the face of death-dealing forces, that's what the Passover story is about. And that's why we continue to tell that story and continue to speak about it when we share in the Lord's Supper, uh, redemption not just from slavery to Pharaoh, but slavery to sin, death, and Satan. God fulfills God's promises.